Hey everyone and welcome back. In this video I will show you how I set up this custom built 190 gallon plywood reptile enclosure for my 10 year old blotched king snake Houdini. If you haven't seen the build video for this enclosure, I definitely recommend watching it. Anyways, let's get right into the setup. This enclosure is going to have live plants that need watered every once in a while. That said, I have to make accommodations to remove any excess water with ease. So I got a 3 quarter inch drill bit and drilled a hole right through the bottom of the enclosure. Then I got myself a 3 quarter inch bulkhead and put it in place. Next I got a ball valve and attached it to a 3 quarter inch tube. The other end of this tube was then attached to the bulkhead. This will allow me to simply turn a lever to remove any excess water when necessary. After getting all of these pieces put together, I wanted to ensure that it would hold water. So I filled up the enclosure slightly and determined that it would do the job. I also rinsed off the sides of the enclosure to remove any debris that I may have missed earlier. Next it was time to make the background. In this case I wanted to make a background that could be easily removed when necessary. In other words, I didn't want to have to silicone it in place like most other backgrounds. That said, for the main pieces of the background I used some insulation foam. I made measurements beforehand that will accommodate for the thickness of another piece of foam as well as the thickness of some cocoa husk liner. That said, I used these measurements and cut three pieces of foam to the appropriate size. Next, I got some planters and made some marks to roughly indicate where I wanted them placed on the background. I then used a utility blade to cut holes similar to the sizes of the ones I marked. These didn't have to be perfect, just large enough to allow the planter to be at an angle. With the planters in place, I then sketched some formations around them. These will act as a guide in just a moment. Then using a screwdriver, I poked holes all throughout the sketched formations. Afterward I flipped the foam over and covered the holes with some paper. Then I proceeded to tape the planters in place with some masking tape and sketch some more formations on the foam. Like before, these formations were also poked full of holes. Next I got some great stuff gaps and cracks foam and used the sketches to spray down some formations. The foam will seep into those holes that I poked earlier and in effect hold on to the insulation foam much tighter than if they weren't there. I kept spraying the foam until I came up with some formations that I really liked. Then I repeated the same process on the other piece of insulation. I should mention that these two pieces will eventually be used on the sides of the enclosure. Next I got the largest piece of insulation foam. Using a utility blade I scored the entire surface and also poked it full of holes with the screwdriver. Then I rolled out some cocoa fiber liner and cut it to the appropriate size. With the liner cut accordingly, I then covered the scored side of the foam with some 100% silicone and put the cocoa fiber liner in place. I went around and did the best I could to spread out the silicone underneath of the liner. Also like before, those scores and holes will create additional surfaces for the silicone to adhere to. Then I cut off the excess liner and scored the back of the foam like before. Finally I put down some more silicone and used a combination of weights and clamps to hold the liner firmly in place while the silicone cured. At this point, the expanding foam on the side panels was fully cured. So afterward I used a scraper to shape the formations. 
I should also mention that I placed that piece of paper earlier so that the expanding foam didn't seep out through the back. Then I rolled out the cocoa fiber liner and cut a piece to size. Afterward I scored the back of the foam like before. However I didn't score the front of this piece because the great stuff foam itself is pretty porous. So a lot of the silicone will get down in there and perform a similar function as say the scores. Again I got some silicone and caulked it all over the front of the foam. Then I attached the cocoa fiber liner much like before. However it was more difficult this time around because of how uneven the surface is. So with a combination of some weights, clamps, and finagling I finally got the liner firmly in place. Then I let the silicone cure for a few hours and remove the clamps and weights. Next I trimmed off the excess liner. Using silicone and clamps, I then attached the excess liner to the back of the foam. Afterward I repeated the same process on the other piece of foam. Next it was time to create a false bottom using some egg crate. I've covered how to do this in other videos, but in short I'm using some zip ties to attach several pieces of egg crate together. I made all of my measurements ahead of time, so all of these pieces are being cut accordingly. I should mention that this false bottom differs from what I typically do because it's the exact size of the enclosure itself. That said, the purpose of this false bottom is to keep the plants in place, as well as keep any excess water separate from the substrate. This will all make more sense later on. Anyways, after making the egg crate structure, I set it into the enclosure to ensure that it was the correct size. Now we will mix up some substrate for the plants. I started out with some organic potting soil, then some cocoa fiber, a little sphagnum moss, some perlite, and finally some sand. All of these components were then mixed thoroughly together. The goal with this mixture was to create a substrate that will retain moisture without becoming soggy, similar to an ABG mix if you will, but not exactly the same. Next up it was time to clean off the plants. I should mention that I was experimenting with a lot of these plants. I would like for all of them to work, but I honestly expect some of them to fail. Anyways I started out with this peace lily. Initially, my goal was to remove any existing substrate and trim down the roots. I thoroughly rinsed off the plant to remove any excess dirt or fertilizers. That said, I'm shooting water straight out of the hose, and peace lilies are pretty sensitive to chlorinated water, so I anticipated some die off from doing it. And it did occur later on, but it was pretty minimal. After getting the lily thoroughly cleaned, I planted it in a new pot with some of the substrate we mixed up just a bit ago. Next I got this large Boston fern and trimmed off a few sections. I really doubt that this plant will actually work, but I wanted to give it a try because I was able to get it for free. I also think it would look pretty cool in this enclosure. So I repeated the same process that was performed on the peace lily. I removed all of the excess dirt and thoroughly rinsed it off. I know that there were no fertilizers used on this plant, but I still want to get it as clean as possible. Then I planted each of these ferns in their own planter using the same substrate as before. Next I got this calathea and cleaned it off just like the other plants. Finally I repeated the same exact process on this philodendron. You may have noticed that each plant was given an exterior planter. That said, I'll explain more about it later on. Anyways, after getting all of the plants cleaned off, I put the false bottom into the enclosure, and then the background. As you can see, the background fits tightly into place without any silicone, and that's exactly what I planned for. I wanted to make this entire setup in a way that could be easily manipulated down the road. With these elements in place, I then grabbed one of those huge cork rounds from the unboxing video, along with some of the plants and try to come up with an arrangement. I should mention that I did sanitize this cork prior to using it. 
I simply rinsed it in warm water and scrubbed it very thoroughly. Normally I would bake or boil something like this, but it's just so large that I wasn't able to do so. After playing around with this layout a bit, I determined that the core ground was just too large as is. So I took it outside and cut a decent section of it off. Afterward, I continued to arrange the elements until eventually I came up with the layout that I liked. Then I grabbed a sharpie and traced the outline of the planters onto the egg crate. Using some wire cutters, I cut along the lines until the planters could fit in place. The idea here is that the false bottom will firmly hold the planters in position. Although he doesn't do it very frequently, Dean is a burrowing snake. That said, when he's digging through the substrate, I didn't want him to be able to uproot the plants. As I stated earlier, each plant has an exterior planter. This is important because one will be attached into the egg crate false bottom, while the other can be removed at any time. After getting all of the appropriate holes cut, I removed everything from the enclosure. Then I rolled out some carbon fiberglass window screen and attached it to the egg crate using some zip ties. To do so, I started by zip tying a single side in place. Then I placed all of the exterior planters into their respective locations and continued to zip tie the remainder of the mesh. After getting the mesh completely secured, I drilled 8 holes into each planter. Using these holes, I zip tied the planters into the egg crate. And that completed all of the work necessary for the false bottom, which was then placed into the enclosure. Next, the backgrounds are placed back into the enclosure. Once again, you can see that they fit snugly into place without the use of silicone. This could easily be done with a single background, you don't need three of them. After getting the backgrounds in place, I dropped all of the plants into their exterior planters. Then I poured in some reptile bark. As you can see, the nice thing about keeping the plants separate is that nothing is mixed together. As I explained earlier, Houdini is a burrowing snake, and he would have easily uprooted the plants in a typical planted enclosure. Also, by this point, you've probably realized that I'm not making this a bioactive enclosure. There are numerous reasons why I set this up the way that I did, and I'll explain it all in the final video for this build. Anyways, once I had a nice layer of bark, I proceeded to add a ficus pumula that I grew myself to one of the planters on the background. We will do more with this later on, but in the meantime I got the cork bark and put it in place. Next, I grabbed the sticks that were in Dean's old enclosure and found a nice spot to put them. Although king snakes aren't arboreal, Dean likes to climb on these sticks pretty frequently, so I wanted to incorporate them in this enclosure as well. Then I put the philodendrons into the background. Afterward, I pinned the ficus pumula to the side of the background. In time, I hope that this covers the entire background on its own, but we'll see what happens. Anyways, from here the plants could finally be watered. To do so, I simply pour some water into the base of each plant. So watering this enclosure is pretty easy, and no spraying is necessary. However, I do typically spray Dean's enclosure when it's time for him to shed. This raises the humidity, which allows his skin to come off in one piece, as opposed to a bunch of fragments. Finally, we can put the water bowl in place. I'm using this water bowl because it's easy to clean, and I feel that it doesn't take away from the overall aesthetic that I'm trying to pull off. With all of the pieces put together, let's get Dean and set him free in his new home. It was really cool to see him explore, and I think this is a perfect example to illustrate how inquisitive snakes can be. However, I quickly realized that there was a slight problem with this setup. 
I had anticipated this early on, but I wanted to see if it would actually occur. If you remember, the planters were left open. This became an issue because Dean systematically went through all of the planters and dug up the dirt. Like in the case of this peace lily. So to stop this from occurring, I simply wrapped some of the window screen mesh onto the planters using rubber bands. I went through the entire enclosure and did this on every single plant. I'm more than confident that this is enough to keep him out of the dirt, and in fact I've seen him try to do it several times and he hasn't had any luck. I also quickly determined that the Boston Fern just wasn't going to work in this setup for a number of reasons. So I got some blue star fern to replace them. I actually think these look better anyways, so I'm not disappointed at all. While adding the blue star ferns, I also added a few miscellaneous pieces of bark just to add more definition to the overall landscape. Another thing that I should mention is the left corner of the enclosure. Right now it's kind of barren and the design seemingly doesn't make sense, but eventually the calathea will grow pretty tall and fill in that space. So in that regard, I'm not fully content with this design as is, but in time it should fill in quite nicely. And again, if any of these plants don't work, or I determine that I want something else, they can easily be swapped out because of the way that I did the planters. Additionally, I may add more plants later on, but that's a topic for a different time. Next, we will briefly go over the lighting for this enclosure. For the plants, I'm using a standard 48 inch LED shop light. It puts out 3000 lumens at 4000 Kelvin using only 30 watts. As of now, I'm very pleased with how this light is working for me. I also put in a Reptile UVB100 by Exoterra. This is effective up to 15 inches, so I placed it just above the core crown to create a basking area. And believe me, Dean is definitely utilizing this new basking area, spending about 3 quarters of the day there. For ventilation, I simply have this 180mm fan hooked up to a timer. It runs for a half hour every 2 hours. This keeps the air moving, as well as drawing new air from the holes in the back. As of now, this is working quite well, but I may modify it down the road. In an enclosure like this where there's minimal air ducts, it's important to have something that keeps the air moving. So in this case, I'm simply using the fan. This feature then leads into the temperature. I don't keep a heating mat on this enclosure, nor do I use anything to heat the enclosure other than the lights themselves. That said, the temperature varies from location to location. For example, the basking spot is around 84 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. However, locations such as the lower right or inside of the core crown are around 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Then the temperature at night drops to around 74 to 76 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take. All of this variation is a good thing. If Dean gets too hot, he can go somewhere that's colder or vice versa. I should also mention that since this is a plywood tank, it retains heat much better than a glass enclosure for example, so in that regard it works in my favor. The humidity on the other hand is fairly consistent, it's roughly 75% throughout the entire enclosure give or take. Whenever the fan runs the humidity will drop slightly since the air is circulating, but this is totally fine. And that about sums it up, currently I'm really liking this setup. It has some growing in to do and I'm sure it will change things in time. My goal with this setup was to make it natural looking while also keeping it very functional. There are a lot of challenges that come with keeping snakes in a naturalistic enclosure and especially burrowing snakes. That said, I did my best to make this setup as practical as possible and I'll discuss more about it later on in another video. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you liked it, please drop me a thumbs up below as it helps support what I'm doing on this channel. As always, I thank you for watching, and I have a lot more naturalistic enclosure builds on the horizon, so stay tuned, and I'll see you next time.